One of the tougher questions that advocates of traditional marriage find to answer, they find harder to answer, is I guess the manipulation and emotional blackmail of of accusations that we're doing harm to homosexual people or at the very best deliberately withholding happiness from them if we deny the change to the institution of marriage. Speak to us about the concerns that perhaps homosexual people are born that way, they can't help it, that mental health will be improved, that suicide rates will be reduced if there's a legal change mm. to, home, to the definition of marriage or so the homosexual lobby would argue. Okay, well there's two things in that. There's, there's the scientific claim that uh, gay people are born that way, which has implications in justice, doesn't it? Kevin Rudd assumed it yeah. on an episode of Q&A. But to clarify, there's a second area you've touched on, which is, uh, if you like, shouldn't we be changing same-sex marriage laws as a form of therapy to help gay kids or gay couples to feel normal and included? So mm. there's two things there, and they're related. And they, they both come up in, in the chapter I've got on um, bullying, blackmail, and born that way. So they're related, but a lot of sincere Christian people even, uh, a minister friend I spoke to said, but if God made them that way, how can, we, how can we get in the way of their happiness? So that's a scientific proposition. And this is what's so embarrassing, uh, David. No science whatsoever supports this notion that homosexual people are born that way. None. Mm. Uh, including openly gay friendly gay advocacy groups like the American Psychological Association which says there is no evidence for how people get to a certain sexual orientation. We don't know. So you can't say they're born that way mm. when the evidence would equally support situational childhood factors, emotional experiences, sometimes tragically inculcations through child abuse, many pathways that people testify to mm. as to why they become homosexual. It's a very complicated matter. Mm. Now, the American Psychiatric Association, um, let me see if I can find it. They say, I'll, I'll just uh, paraphrase. Uh, again, they say that none of the available science is able to establish the cause for same-sex attraction. None. So we simply do not know uh, how people end up experiencing same-sex attraction, but it is simply fantasy to claim that you're born that way. That's a nonsense. Mm. And the most interesting line of evidence there is that about two-thirds of young people who say, I'm gay, will no longer say they're gay in just a matter of months to years. Wow. And I, in my chapter, I give multiple lines oh, of I know one young person with that, that experience. Yeah. Mm. So if the majority of young gay people don't stay that way, well, they certainly weren't born that way. Yeah. Some will stay that way. But uh, it is simply propaganda and, cle and sort of um, sound bites to say that, as, as Lady Gaga does, that you're born this way. You, you just, that's an empty claim. And not only that, it's, it's wrong to tell young people that they're born that way mm. if two thirds of them are going to change and get over their confusion and live just ordinary lives. Mm. It's wrong to make them come out at school prematurely as identifying as gay when you know that two thirds of them would have left it behind. It's wrong in many ways. Uh, even in the most basic medical way, why would you lock a young person into a destiny and a lifestyle that they might have avoided mm -hmm. if you just let them alone? Why would you lock them into a lifestyle that, for example, even taking the basic idea of STDs and venereal disease, um, you know that 80% uh, roughly of all cases of HIV AIDS, for example, are in men who have sex with men. And it, that has always been the case in Australia. All, always been that new cases 
of HIV are in many of sex men. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the medical aspects of homosexuality. That's not the discussion now. Mm. But all I'm saying is that how could any parent or teacher deliberately chaperone a young person into that future mm. when they know from the science and from the evidence that two-thirds of those 17-year-olds who say they're gay will no longer say they're gay when they're 21? I don't think... I don't think they do know. I think they don't know. The media. I think the media has over and over and over again, as I said before, Kevin Rudd on Q and A challenged uh, Pastor Matt Prater in front of the whole nation on live TV mm. to deny that people were born that way. It was an absolute assumption on behalf of the then Prime Minister of Australia yeah. that it was a given. But one important thing to say to your viewers: that does not mean they choose to be gay. And that they can unchoose. Mm. That is very trivial to say that. Mm. In yeah. my understanding yeah. of my patients and my friends and people who've ended up same sex attracted, they did not choose it. Mm. It comes about in these cases from deep childhood uh, experiences and, and pressures and factors and adolescent experiences over which they had no control mm. at all. And they did not choose it, and we must never say they did. But what we must also never say is that you're, you, you, you can only be that way, you cannot change. That is simply false. There are thousands of testimonies, moving testimonies of men and women who've lived as homosexuals for many, many, many years and then for reasons of their own right. change. I'll give an example, the most famous example, but if But again, you like. these won't make the media because they're well, not fitting the narrative. Well, for example, at one of the Senate inquiries into one of the earlier marriage laws, we had a... A gentleman there who testified to the Senate committee that he'd lived as a homosexual man for 30 years and then he left that behind. He's now married with kids and he counsels other people. Wow. That, of course, was completely ignored by the media because mm. it doesn't fit the narrative. Mm. Likewise, a more potent example was Michael Glatzi. And Michael Glatzi was the founder in America of Young Gay America. He was the pinup boy for gay subculture in America. Wow. And then uh, several years about a decade back, I think now, he announced that he was leaving the gay subculture. And uh, in about 2004, was it? He married his girlfriend, Rebecca. And the interview that I have in my book that he has with a, a psychologist friend of mine in America is so moving, so moving. He just says, look, he says, leaving homosexuality is like, uh, it's like it's just like waking up. It's like coming out of a dream. It's all I can describe it as. Wow. He still loves his gay friends, but he, he says... Anyway, you've got to read the interview. The point is, these people change. They're not... They don't need counselling to change. They, they just change yeah. because they want to. And my very strong objection is to the likes of Daniel Andrews and Victoria, who wants to bring in laws to prohibit such people getting any help from their... That's terrible. ...pastors, their psychologists, their doctors. They want to outlaw the idea that young Christian men and women, for example, who want to change, can be given any help. Yeah. And remember, when I say change, it's not a sort of flick the switch change. It is a matter of minimizing your unwanted homosexual attractions and maximizing your heterosexual potential to a state where you can live in peace live according to what you think is right and good. Mm. It's a beautiful thing. And Daniel Andrews and, and people like him in America are trying to criminalize it and stop these people seeking their goals. Right now I'm predicting thousands of, of hateful reactions in the comments beneath this video on YouTube at the mere suggestion that um, that there could be anything less than ideal about the homosexual lifestyle and somebody wanting to minimise that. If they do have that reaction, let them go to the book and let them read some of the most prominent gay and lesbian activists who agree that if people want to change. Camille Paglia saying that if a, if a man wants to learn how to respond to a woman and have a family, good on him. He should not be strafed by the artillery fire of reverse moralism from the gay lobby. So she's a, she's a tough one. Yep. But Peter Tatchell, other gay activists, get reasonable. Join, if you're a gay lesbian person watching, get with those mature, 
reasonable, decent fellow citizens who are gay and lesbian who say, yeah, sure, I mean, if people want to do that, all power to them. They're not betraying the cause. That is their autonomy. Yep. Very, um, very quickly before we end this segment, mm. is there any evidence, data, research to suggest that legalising homosexual marriage mm. will cause a reduction in suicide rates? Look, that's a hard one. This is the emotional blackmail that Bill Shorten used to sink the plebiscite. He said, if you even have a debate over same-sex marriage, uh, LGBT people will suicide. That is the most shameful, despicable bit of politics I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, it's, it's insulting all of us who want to keep marriage true. He called us haters crawling out from under rocks. And not only that, it has no shred of evidence. No shred. Overseas, where they've had plebiscites or referenda on same-sex marriage, there's been no rise in uh, same-sex depression, suicide. There was nothing in Ireland. Mm. There was nothing in, in, in parts of America that had their debate. Now, um, I would say that, again, self-respecting gay and lesbian people should be up in arms saying, do not treat us like pitiful little petals that can't even be exposed to an argument that we disagree with. Don't treat us like children. We are fellow citizens with you. We will argue our case for gay marriage. Or if you're like Paddy Manning, we'll argue our case against gay marriage, even mm. though we're gay. We will argue our case like fellow citizens. Don't treat us like pitiful little puffballs when we are as much a citizen as you and we want to have this great debate. And that's what they should have said. Now, David, the last aspect of the emotional argument for changing same-sex marriage is that we should do it in order to affirm young LGBT people, to somehow give them confidence that, that they're normal and included in society. But all I ask is for a sense of proportion here. Mm. Are we really proposing that we should overturn the foundation of society mm. with all the harm that will flow to future children who will miss out on their mother or their father, uh, to the imposition of uh, same-sex sex education on kids, which follows from same-sex marriage, to the silencing of any pastors or other dissenters under the new anti-discrimination law that flows from same-sex marriage. All of that is to be accepted for the sake of what? For the sake of, of some psychological therapy for some troubled kids. Mm -hmm. We're meant to change marriage as a form of emotional support for some troubled kids. It's, there are other ways to help, Dave. There's less radical things that we can do to make these young, uh, young people feel loved and affirmed and included in our schools and churches and clubs and whatever. Okay? Mm. So I would say that is just a crazily disproportionate and reckless. Is there any evidence to suggest it would even be effective? Uh, well, no, because there's no evidence to suggest that um, for example, gay bullying is any higher than any other form of bullying, for a start. These are facts which really should be out there. We don't even know if gay suicide is higher than heterosexual people. We don't know that. We know there's more suicide attempts, but we don't know there's more suicide. We know women attempt suicide much more than men, but they actually have a lower suicide rate. Hmm. So there's no correlation between attempts and actual suicide. So a lot of this is just emotional huff and puff to make us feel like, oh dear, well gee, if we don't change marriage, we've got blood on our hands because people will suicide. That's illogical. It's not based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. And we should be based on the evidence. Absolutely. So I would say get rid of these emotional um, hyperventilations and simply say that um, young people who identify for now Two thirds of them will change, but for now they identify as same sex attracted. You just accept and, 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 and knock along with them, that's fine, let them follow their path. But they already have the same status in law, the same benefits in law. If they, if they want to become a de facto couple, they have the same. Everything's, there's no discrimination anywhere. Mm. Don't change marriage under this false idea that it's a form of therapy for kids or it's a form of reducing this plague of gay based bullying, which probably doesn't even exist out of proportion to other bullying. Let's get anti-bullying programs for everything. Yeah. Nobody should be bullied because of their sexual orientation. Nobody should be bullied because they're fat or thin or dumb or whatever. It's ugly, it's gotta be stopped. Mm. Uh, but um, I don't have much time for this emotional blackmail that's used. No, I agree. Good points, well made. 
In our next segment, we're going to ask Dr. David Van Gend about the similarities or differences between uh, the current laws around marriage and previous laws that used to ban black people from marrying white people. Is there any similarity? And we're also going to talk about the implications for freedom of religion in the wake of redefining marriage.